Our theme this year is expanding the practice spectrum. Throughout the next four days, you will be challenged to prepare yourself and your colleagues to evaluate and manage the evolving practice models that are contributing to the evolution of professional practice. State Leadership Conference is a unique advocacy and leadership training event. It's a gathering of hundreds of psychology leaders from APA's 60 state, provincial, and territorial affiliates, and several APA divisions involved in practice advocacy. And now it is my pleasure to introduce someone who has spent the past year serving as the chair of the Committee of State Leaders. She is a past and uh, former president of the Massachusetts Psychological Association, Dr. Mabel Lamb. Okay, on behalf of the Committee of State Leaders, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2016 State Leadership Conference. At this time, I would like to introduce the Committee of State Leaders to you. As I do so, I would like them to stand and remain standing. Please hold your applause until I, introduce, I have introduced the full committee. Dr. Felicia Smith, Chair-Elect of CSL. Um, Dr. Lisa Rocchio, Past Chair of CSL and Chair of Awards Subcommittee. Dr. Kathleen Ashton, Member at Large and Chair of the Orientation Subcommittee, and she's also the CAP representative. Mr. Cheval Briggins, CESPA representative. Ms. Sarah Bowen, uh, CESPA chair and representative. Dr. Douglas Cave, Canadian Psychological Association representative. Dr. Tracy Cipriano, director of Pro uh, professional affairs representative. Dr. Le Laandra Clark Harvey, Early Career Psychologist Representative. Dr. S Teresa Coddington, Member at Large. Dr. Travis Caldwell, Member at Large. Um, Dr. Eleanor Gil Kashiwabara, Member at Large. Dr. Jessica Lar Lloyd, Diversity Liaison and Chair of the Diversity Subcommittee. Dr. Wendy Plant, Federal Advocacy Coordinator Representative from Rhode Island and Chair of the Advocacy Mentoring Subcommittee. Dr. Randy Randleman, Federal Advocacy Coordinator from Oklahoma. Dr. Linda Reddy, BPA Representative. Mr. Jared Tucker, APA Graduate Student Representative. And Dr. Erica Wise, Division 31 Representative. They're the full committee and they have been really hardworking. Thank you. So, so I would like to thank the committee members for their hard work over the past year. The committee prepares the President's elect orientation training, the early career psychologist orientation and training, and the diversity uh, delegates orientation. And this year, the diversity discussion group will be um, a continuation from last year's, the focus on strategies for coping with microaggressions in psychology leadership. In addition, CSL is responsible for the advocacy mentoring program, which this, where, this year will include a workshop that combines the expertise of PEC and FAC to use the public education to advance the professional psychology's advocacy agenda. This morning we had the orientation training for the present elect uh, early career psychologists and diversity delegates. I believe the programs were dynamic, uh, energizing, extremely useful and beneficial. The committee selects an individual each year to receive the State Leadership Award. In addition, the committee provides input and feedback to the practice organization staff, who have the primary responsibility for developing the State Leadership Conference this year. 
I would like to acknowledge and thank Dr. Catherine Nordo and the practice organization staff who have worked tirelessly to put together this conference for all of us to learn about the skills and efficacy needed to support a range of practice models. The committee would like to especially thank Dr. Dan Abrahamson and Ms. Susie Lazaroff for supporting and helping to coordinate the work of the committee. I want to thank all of you for being here and please join the committee for state leaders at the town hall meeting at, on Monday at 2 p.m. Okay, now I would like to introduce Ms. Sarah Bowen, the Chair of the Council of Executives of State and Provincial Psychological Association, or CESPA, and is commonly known and a member of CSL. She is also the Executive Director of Wisconsin State Psychological Association. Thank you. Hello, I don't I think I have to repeat our long title. Um, we'll just go with CESPA from here on in. CESPA is all of your executive directors. The, the, whether you are a, a Canadian SPTA, a large SPTA, uh, a, a, an SPTA with fewer than 50 members, you have, thanks in large part to um, APA practice organization and the grant program and the existence of CESPA, you have an executive director. You have somebody to watch over your functioning and so forth. I'd like all the executive directors who are in the room, and there should be like 61 of you, I believe, um, to stand and, and accept our applause and thanks. <laughs> CESPA is actually what I consider sort of a, a value-added feature of your executive director. Because of CESPA, your executive director can bring to you the expertise, the experience, positive and negative, of other states with issues, with management styles, with office operation issues, with tax audits, um, lots of interesting things that CESPA adds to the knowledge base of your own executive director. And that, I think, is one of the largest values, unexpected sometimes, that APA practice organization brings to all the SPTAs by virtue of supporting CESPA. So, my word to you primarily is support your executive director. Um, and by that I mean not just pay them a decent salary, but, but be sure they come to these important meetings. Be, be sure that person participates in the listserv, interacts with their mentor or serves as a mentor and participates in our sum annual summer meeting, which is all about association management and how, to, how we can continuously improve ourselves in service to our states and provinces. Thank you. Um, I would like to hand this over now to Kate Brown, who is obviously, as you all know, a very important feature of the whole system as chair of CAP. Hi, everyone. Well, it's so great to see so many psychologist leaders, executive directors, and friends of psychology in this room. What brain power. What we all can do together is amazing. On behalf of the Committee for the Advancement of Professional Practice, I also want to give you a really a heartfelt welcome and thank you for making time out of your busy schedules to attend the State Leadership Conference. In a few minutes, I will have our CAP members stand and be recognized. But before I do, I want to be sure that everyone in this room understands what the practice organization does for you. We're very fortunate in psychology to have two strong companion organizations to address the whole range of issues in both psychology and for psychologists. 
APA and the APA Practice Organization are two legally distinct organizations. APA is a charitable organization to serve and benefit the public. While the Practice Organization is our trade association dedicated to advancing and protecting the practice of professional psychology. So APA is for psychology and APA Practice Organization is for, psychologi is for psychologists. So if you are interested in challenging reimbursement rate cuts, taking action against insurance company abuses, advocating for practitioners' interest in healthcare reform, affirming the doctoral standard for entry into the profession, confronting assaults on scope of practice, fostering political action for psychology, and advocating for higher rates and expansion in Medicare, then the practice organization is your membership organization. Our practitioner members are a critical part of our success, and we hope to continue to hear from you throughout this conference and throughout the year regarding issues that you are facing in your states, provinces, and territories. And we have just launched this week our new practice organization listserv so that we all can continue to communicate with each other and that we can hear what you need for us to help you. The landscape of psychological practice is being shaped by federal and state governments within the regulatory and legal arenas and by marketplace opportunities created by the enactment of the Federal Affordable Care Act. To ensure that the practice organization meets its vision and, and mission, CAP has outlined the goals and objectives of our strategic plan in five main areas to guide the work of your practice organization. Legislative advocacy, legal and regulatory advocacy, marketplace issues, professional identity of psychologists, and political action. We hope that you see these goals throughout the entire content of this conference. We are so proud of the work that all of you do in your states, territories, and provinces, and value your input to help us, again, help you. Through the Practice Organization Grants Programs to the state, provincial, and territorial psychological associations, we're so impressed by all you have accomplished and all you continue to work on, often we know with meager resources. The practice organization grants have been a cornerstone of the support we provide to our state associations working at the grassroots level. We know the challenges you face can sometimes seem overwhelming, and again, we are here to help you. We hope that this conference invigorates you and ignites you to be prepared for your Hill visits with your senators and representatives on Tuesday. I now would like to ask our current CAP members to stand and be recognized. Dr. Jun Ching, Vice Chair, Dr. Kathleen Ashton, Dr. Lindsay Buckman, Dr. Tracy Cipriano, Dr. Arthur Evans, Dr. Bravada Garrett Akinsanya, Dr. Joe Linder Crow, Dr. Peter Oppenheimer, Dr. Judith Patterson, Dr. Roberto Perez, Dr. Derek Fi Phillips, and Dr. Bonnie Markham, our ex officio member as the practice organization treasurer. Your CAP members, practice organization board members, and APA Board of Professional Affairs members work together throughout the year with the APA practice organization and practice directorate staff to protect, defend, and enhance the practice of psychology and allow practicing psychologists to have a thriving, culturally competent, scientifically-based, ethical profession that provides us all with respect, opportunity, and financial well-being. I would now like to introduce our multi-talented leader and staunch advocate who works tirely, tirelessly on behalf of professional psychology every day. She is spirited, focused, encouraging, and a great team leader. We are fortunate to have such a strong leader for practice. The Executive Director for Professional Practice, the APA Practice Directorate, and the APA Practice Organization, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Katherine Nordle.
no dance steps, no dance steps this year. I might fall right down here in the North Carolina. Somebody challenged me to that, and we just couldn't find the right music, so no dance steps, sorry. Good afternoon. Oh, a little louder. Wake up. You've had a big lunch. Good afternoon. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome to Washington. Welcome to our 2016 State Leadership Conference. It's really great to see all of you here. I'm really heartened to see the number of first-timers as well. And I'm very pleased to welcome all of you who are first-timers. It's been quite a year for APA, as many of you know, and it's been a challenging year for your practice organization. I know how troubling and painful these last eight months have been for you as members, as psychologists, and as state leaders. The independent review sent shockwaves through APA, through its staff, through its members, and the psychology community at large. It is certainly going to take all of us some time to heal, but I do believe that the association is moving in the right direction. A newly appointed ethics committee will be examining and making recommendations about ethics policies and procedures in APA, and examining the role of an ethics office and an ethics officer and committee within the APA. This new commission, which was just announced this week, has 17 members, nine of whom are psychologists, and I see Dr. Erica Wise in the room. She's one of the psychologists. Are there any other psychologists on the commission that are here at the meeting? Dr. Erica Wise. And eight of the remaining commissioners come from related fields of medicine, law, and ethics. It is really a stellar group. The commission is jointly chaired by Dr. Melba Vasquez, a former APA president, author, an ethics scholar, and Dr. Paul Root Wolpe, who is the director of the Emory University Center for Ethics. A new work group has also developed a set of conflict of interest policies and procedures for APA governance and staff. And there are a number of other post-independent review resolutions that will be coming out of the board and council. You will have the opportunity to address many of these issues uh, and other issues as well with Dr. Cynthia Villar and Dr. Susan McDaniel at a plenary session on Monday afternoon. This is an open forum, so you will be able to voice your concerns, ask questions, hear about Dr. Villar's plans for APA, as well as Dr. McDaniel's initiatives. Certainly another distressing matter for members has been the practice assessment lawsuit settlement. I know a number of you, because I've heard from many, we're very frustrated by the settlement process, which was handled totally outside of APA by an independent administrator. But more importantly, and what concerns me the most, is the disappointment and the loss of faith that some of you and your colleagues felt, or may still feel, towards APA and towards your practice organization. On a personal level, as your colleague, and as a member of APA, as a staff member, and as a psychologist, I feel and understand your anger, your anxiety, and your frustration. We are committed to being more transparent, communicating more often and being in dialogue with you, and finding ways to engage more of you in the work that we're doing. And it is my sincerest hope that we can find a way to earn back your trust as we continue our work together to build a great future for our discipline and our profession. Our state leadership conference has always been an opportunity for you psychologists to come together, to exchange knowledge, to share your expertise, advocate for professional practice, and tackle some of the major issues confronting our profession. Over the years, State Leadership Conference has become a wonderful melting pot, which is very obvious as we've had several of the different constituencies stand up, representing several generations, various work settings, and cultural and ethical backgrounds. Those of you here at the conference represent a range of work settings, including private practice, but even more so including academia, hospitals, clinics, nursing homes, university counseling centers, 
and a variety of other settings. This year, 30% of you are early career psychologists. So there is much dark hair in the room as opposed to a lot of gray hair like I've been developing. <laughs> State leadership is a major training ground. For those of you who have been here, you certainly appreciate that. But a major training ground for leadership and advocacy for our students, for our early career psychologists, and for our diversity delegates. And what a great group of diversity dele delegates we had. I had the honor of attending their, their dinner last night. A number of folks in this room, as a matter of fact, got their start as an SLC diversity delegate. One of them is sitting right over there with the Minnesota group, Dr. Uh, Bravada Garrett Akansanya. She is the current president of APA's Division 35, which is the Society for Women, a member of our CAP and the APA Council, and she was the first African-American president of the Minnesota Psychological Association. Dr. Jun Ching, our CAP co-chair, uh, our vice chair, I should say, was a diversity delegate, has been an a, uh, a state association president, and has been a recent uh, past president of Division 42, the Division of Independent Practice, as well as a council rep. We've also watched our early career psychologists move up the leadership ranks as well in their state and provincial associations. In the house with us tonight, if he would raise his hand somewhere, Dr. Jamie Brass, president-elect of the Utah Psychological Association. Uh, sorry, I, did I say he? I meant she. Um, first attended as an early career uh, psychologist. Dr. Zoe Proctor Weber, president of the, Psycholo uh, the Florida Psychological Association. Dr. Lisa Lenning, uh, an APA council rep for Nevada, are both past early career delegates to the State Leadership Conference. So, So to all of the graduate students, the diversity delegates and early career delegates here at SLC, we have really high hopes for you. You are our future leaders, and we trust that you will lend a hand to those coming behind you to help groom even another cohort of psychology's leaders. Yeah. Whoever that was, woo! So in spite of what has been, I think since in my nine years here at APA, a difficult and challenging 2015 for all of us, your practice organization staff and governance members have continued to work for you, for our profession, and for the patients and clients that we serve. In 2015, the practice organization provided $480,000 of grants for organizational development, legislation and emergencies to the states and Canadian provincial psychological associations. The Georgia Psychological Association received a grant to support efforts to clearly define psychological testing in the state licensing law. And we know how important that is because we know what's happening to that part of our scope of practice out in the states. The Michigan Psychological Association received a grant uh, to support efforts to pursue legislation another very important one, to protect the doctoral standard for the practice of psychology and the use of the title psychologist. The Ohio Psychological Association received funds to address reimbursement issues related to retroactive rescinding of prior author authorization of treatment that had been approved by insurers and then they decided not to pay. And West Virginia received a grant to pursue a sequence of training bill. So lots of important stuff that these grants go to support to protect that practice at the state level. These are just a few examples of how the states have benefited, both through our finances as well as collaboration with them. Thanks to more than 10 years of legislative advocacy by the practice organization, in collaboration with other health professions, Congress finally repealed that sustainable growth rate cut. And we... <laughs> Good for us. And by doing so, we averted a 21% reduction to your Medicare fees starting this year. As a result of our grassroots efforts and the work of our practice organization's government relations staff, the Medicare Mental Health Access Act was introduced this past December 
by Representative Christy Nome, a Republican from South Dakota, whom, by the way, we will be honoring at our banquet Monday night. And Illinois, go, go South Dakota. And Illinois Representative Jan Schakowsky, a Democrat and longtime champion for psychology. Just this Thursday, our physician definition bill was introduced in the United States Senate by Susan Collins from Maine and Sherrod Brown from Ohio. So when you go to the Hill on Monday, we've got bipartisan legislation in both houses to include psychologists in the physician definition in Medicare. which I might add is sort of like long overdue. It will allow us to practice to the full extent of our licensure in the Medicare program, free of unneeded physician supervision, which in many areas creates real problems and extra expenses in healthcare systems. Psychologists are the only doctorally trained healthcare professionals in the Medicare program who are not in the physician definition. It took us a long time to get into Medicare, about 25 years, and now it's taking us about another 25 to try to get uh, in, the med in the physician definition, which, oh, by the way, happens to include podiatrists, dentists, chiropractors, and optometrists, and folks have a problem with psychologists? I don't quite get that. The practice organization is also supporting the Helping Families and Mental Health Crisis Act. This is a bill introduced in the House by, again, one of our own Pennsylvania psychologists, Tim Murphy, and his colleague, Texas uh, Representative Eddie Bernice Johnson. This legislation aims to improve access to effective evidence-based care. I know that Dr. Evans likes to hear about that, particularly with those with the most severe mental disorders and also includes additional training dollars in addition to GPE for psychology training. We're also supporting the Mental Health Awareness and Improvement Act of 2015, introduced in the Senate in December by Lamar Alexander from Tennessee, and another one of our champions, Patty Murray from Washington State. This legislation focuses on suicide prevention, mental health care for children and older adults, and the integration of mental and physical health care. So you'll get a lot more information about these bills during your Hill briefings tomorrow and Monday, and you've got uh, a heavy load to be carrying to the Hill uh, on Monday with about lots of stuff that is really good for the patients that we serve. For those of you who are Medicare providers, and I might add many of our colleagues have decided to opt out of that program, but for those of you who are Medicare providers and or thinking of becoming one, there's a workshop on Monday that I think is really important for you to attend. It's called Medicare, Finding Your Way Through the Maze. And that's probably an understatement of, the, of what that workshop will be about. You'll have the opportunity to learn about changing Medicare regulations and the Physician Quality Reporting System, also known as PQRS. PQRS is a mandated program for Medicare providers to submit data that you collect on your patients in the process of treatment. And you submit that on an annual basis to CMS uh, along with your, with your claims, or have been with your claims. PQRS used to be, for those of you who have been in the program, used to be have an incentive-based component. But now it's only a penalty-based program. So if you do not report these quality measures, you will find that your Medicare fees will continue to be reduced year after year. We know that reporting these quality measures has been a very difficult and frustrating process for a lot of clinicians. So to help ease the burden of that reporting, we teamed up last year, a year end of 14, with Healthmonics to create a registry which we call APAPO PQRS Pro. That's a big mouthful. Increasingly, Medicare is developing new mental health measures, which can only be reported through a registry. So they are moving towards eliminating individual claims-based reporting and moving towards registry reporting. So if you're a Medicare provider, be sure and, and uh, attend that workshop. It will provide for you a lot of very helpful information. 
Another important aspect, of course, Dr. Puente is well aware of this, are, is the work that we do around reimbursement codes and uh, a reimbursement involving the CPT and RUC processes at, at the AMA. We have an Office of Healthcare Financing attached to our Center for Psychology and Health. That office is headed up by Dr. Randy Phelps. He spearheads our work in not only the development of procedure codes for psychologists to use, but also the evaluation of those codes. That work impacts not only what Medicare will pay and allow, it impacts the Medicaid fee structure, and perhaps even more importantly to some of you, it impacts what the commercial carriers will allow, will allow for psychological and, and testing um, uh, services. A substantial portion of the work, though, of the Office of Healthcare Financing is actually supported by your practice organization budget because of the nature of that work. You might be glad to know that just this week we launched a new series that Dr. Phelps and Debbie Lanzi and his office will be authoring. It's called Up to Code, and it will be in your practice update e-newsletter with lots of good information to keep you up to date on what you need to know about coding issues, both in regard to Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial carriers. We continue to have a substantial Medicaid agenda in practice. And the reason for that is that Medicaid is the single largest payer of mental health and substance use services in this country, bar none. And we anticipate that it will continue to grow in terms of its importance in funding those kinds of services. In 2015, we advocated very successfully for the expansion of psychological services and reimbursement in the Medicaid system. Currently, our staff is working with several states, among them North Carolina and the District of Columbia, uh, on these issues. In 2015, the Education Directorate allocated some money for a Medicaid Policy and Advocacy Fellowship position, which is currently occupied by a health care attorney. She works with us in practice to help remove barriers for not only psychologists, but also for interns' participation in the Medicaid system. And several states have been successful in getting their interns reimbursed. Very importantly, these services will increase and enhance care for the underserved population. And we are hopeful that secondarily, to some of you primarily, that it will help ease our internship imbalance by making internship slots more economically sustainable and helping to financially support those internship programs. We are thrilled to be working with education on this. We understand how critical the internship and balance has been, and we want to make sure that all of our students in the pipeline can get the very best training available, and we think this is going to help with that. In 2015, we saw the fruits of our labor from several years of work by our very capable legal and regulatory attorneys in practice with commercial insurers, working with commercial insurers. They persuaded Anthem to fire Sante Analytics as its auditor and stop abusive audits of psychological and neuropsychological testing. When we gave this report at council last week, or part of it, one of the council members came up to me and he said, you know, I, I, used, I used to get those audits all the time. And he said, all of a sudden they stopped, and now I understand why. It was because of the work of our legal and regulatory department. And as a result of the practice organization's advocacy with insurance companies to properly implement parity, you may not know, but there were some insurance companies that were paying the same dollar amount for a 45-minute therapy session as they were paying for a 60-minute therapy session, and they are no longer paying the same rate and are actually paying a higher rate for the 60-minute therapy code. On a daily basis, our legal and regulatory staff field calls from thousands of practice organizations, not th in, an, in a year, thousands of, of practice organization members around a lot of different issues. The phones ring regularly about things like HIPAA compliance, record keeping, electronic health records, telepsychology, scope of practice, licensing issues. Oh my God, the deputy just arrived in my office with a subpoena. What am I supposed to do? Duty to warn and working with individuals around abusive insurance and managed care practices. We handled more than 1,000 of these types of calls in this last year. 
This year, there's been a lot of hype around the presidential election. I'm sure many of you have been watching the, uh, uh, the caucuses and, and debates with interest like I have. But there's another election that we really need to pay attention to this year. One of our own, Dr. Ted Strickland from Ohio, where's you Ohio folks, <laughs> is running for the United States Senate. Now some of you may not know that Ted was the first psychologist elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. He's always stayed true to his roots as a psychologist and maintains his APA membership while serving in the Congress and when serving as governor of Ohio. He will be joining us here tomorrow at state leadership. I encourage all of you to please show up at the reception that we will be having for him. Uh, come and meet Ted, get to know him, lend him your support. Let's help elect the first psychologist ever to the United States Senate. And tomorrow morning, you're going to get to hear lots of interesting stuff about the political landscape and how it might affect professional psychology. We'll be joined by well-known journalist and political commentator Mark Shields. Many of you may remember the Brooks and Shields on Friday night on PBS. And then he is a regular panelist on Inside Washington, the weekly public affairs show that airs both on PBS and ABC. Mark has worked in Washington through 10 presidential administrations. He was with us about a decade ago, I think. He has spoken at state leadership once before. I look forward to his thoughts about this current and, what can I say, really wacky presidential campaign. So I'm sure Mark will have some interesting comments. It'll be interesting to see what he thinks uh, about uh, Chris Christie's endorsement of Donald Trump. So somebody throw that question out to him tomorrow. <laughs> and for the first time in SLC history, our federal advocacy coordinators are teaming up with our public education campaign coordinators in holding a joint workshop on how public education can help foster relationships with policymakers and bolster our federal advocacy uh, efforts. So I hope that all of you folks will be great tweeters and Instagrammers and whatever all we're going to do to really be getting those words out. We're also going to spend some time talking about association membership events, as I said earlier, like the independent review and the practice assessment lawsuit have impacted membership, particularly in the practice organization. And I would imagine there's been some trickle down to the states. Uh, we'll address a lot of membership issues during Monday morning's plenary sponsored by SESPA. Uh, if membership is a challenge for your organization, and I doubt that nobody would not hold up their hand, you'll want to be there. It's a catchy title, all about members, how to get them, how to keep them, and how to satisfy them. And you'll have a chance to meet APA's new executive director for membership, Mr. Ian King. So at this SLC, we're going to have a lot of programming as well about both new and traditional models of providing psychological services. We'll look at real life examples of innovative practices, ranging from simple options that most psychologists have the capability of implementing in their own offices two large, complex, integrated systems and models that can provide really great new opportunities for entrepreneurial psychologists. And we'll explore how psychologists can participate in integrated, evidence-based systems to improve patient care. This year's opening session and the theme of SLC, Expanding the Practice Spectrum, grew out of a successful multi-state summit that some of you have already heard about in integrated healthcare and alternative practice models that was held in New York City last May. That summit was a collaborative effort of the practice organization and several state associations. It was designed to help psychologists learn the nuts and bolts of getting involved in, working with, and even developing systems of care that promote the integration of mental and physical health services. Today's opening session, as well as three additional workshops, will focus on the practical skills and information you need to help your members successfully navigate this evolving healthcare system. We have some incredible psychologists out in the field doing really innovative things with group practice structures and integrated care systems. And we also have psychologists who prefer to remain in the traditional and, and very successful fee-for-service practice model. 
We need all of you to continue to demonstrate the real value of psychology as a health profession wherever it's practiced. So that's why this year's programming focuses on skills and advocacy needed to support the entire range of traditional and new practice models. For those of you who have been here before, this opening session is a little different format from previous years where typically I've spoken and then we've had somebody else from outside of psychology typically come and speak. This year we have three keynote speakers, all psychologists, who are going to kick off our conference. Dr. Nancy Ruddy, Vice President for Patient Engagement at McCann Health, is going to discuss physician-psychologist collaboration for the benefit of patients in need of mental and behavioral health services. And Dr. Ruddy is going to talk about her recent career shift in which she applies her psychological expertise to educational tools for patients, helping them manage a broad array of medical illnesses. Dr. Arthur Evans, a member of CAP, the Commissioner of the Philadelphia Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services, will speak from his perspective as a leader and director in the Philadelphia Medicaid Behavioral Health Program. He'll touch on many of the opportunities that the Medicaid expansion and related programs have created for psychologists who wish to improve the outcomes of patients in underserved populations. Dr. Jeffrey Kanner is president of Comprehensive Med Psych Systems. He will talk about a management services organization model, something you all may not be familiar with, but it's called an MSO. Doc, this model requires substantial resources and energy to launch, but it holds promise as a model that many other psychologists can plug into while maintaining their current practices and their business autonomy. We have some really brilliant psychologists doing a lot of brilliant things, thinking outside the box and trying new and innovative ways to practice. And I am just thrilled that the three who you will be hearing from today are, were able to come and be with us and, and lend their skills and expertise. They are leaders in expanding practice. They are leaders in advocating for our, for our profession. They are leaders in helping to ensure a bright and positive future for professional psychology. So I hope that you will come away from this leadership conference inspired, inspired to take up professional challenges, excited, excited about expanding the spectrum of your practice, whatever and wherever that may be, and even more committed, committed to working to build a bright future for what I think is a just most awesome of professions, and that is the profession of psychology. Thank you for all that all of you do for all of us and for our patients, and have a great SLC. Thank you. Behavioral health services is such a critical part of, of overall health within family medicine, a large percentage of patients come in with medical problems that put them at risk for behavioral diagnosis like depression. Depression is the number one complication of childbirth. The numbers of children that have unmet behavioral and developmental needs is staggering. We know there's an unmet need in our community. Let's go ahead and address it. There's a lot of energy around integrated care, and I think there's a lot of good reasons to believe that sort of reconnecting the mind and the body and caring for them as one is going to lead to better outcomes. It offers way more seamless service. It gives me an opportunity to always have the physicians in the office. We can consult, they know the families, I know the families, and we come together and we just provide a much better service to the families. I mean, I love practicing this way because I have the doctors as a resource. The longer we work together, the more expert we each get at what the other one does. In terms of having their medical record, you have so much more context and you just, you have a team to work with. So what has allowed me to do is see patients more efficiently and see them more effectively. We're able to reduce a lot of barriers to care. You can't tell looking at our patients in the waiting room who's here to see whom. So I think the stigma goes completely away. It's a godsend. We really have 
a, a, an opportunity for constant collaboration, feeling like we're really a true member of the medical team. There's that capacity that gets built yeah, yeah. and that comfort level that comes from practicing together. We raise each other's skill set. We need psychologists in private practice. We need psychologists working in mental health clinics to be able to care for our patients. But we also need psychologists in primary care settings. It's a great model. I can't think of doing psychology outside of the model that we do it here um, in an integrated care model. I could not imagine nor want to practice in, in any other way. This is just good for preventive health. It's good health care. Most importantly, it's what we ought to be doing. You know, it takes a village to raise children. Well, they're part of my village. Um, I could not have dreamed 10 years ago that we'd be showing that at State Leadership Convention. Um, it makes my heart sore. And I could stand up here and talk about integrated primary care all day long. Truly, I could. People who know me know that's true. That said, I was actually asked to take a 10,000 square foot view of where we are and where we want to go. So tomorrow I have a panel, I'll talk all day long about integrated primary care, and anybody here who has a question about it or wants to learn more about it, bring it on. I would love to talk about it. But you guys are our leaders. I am so, and it sounds cheesy, but I'm honored to talk to you guys today because all of you guys are the movers and shakers in our field. Your peers have selected you as the people to represent them. And those of you that are watching from home, you're giving up a Saturday afternoon to watch this. So something tells me you're a little engaged in this process too. And I think that's fabulous. So where I want to start us off at is where do we want to go from here? Because what we do today, what we talk about today, really sets the stage for where we're going to end up tomorrow. So when the State Leadership Conference folks, the practice organization, put this together, they did kind of a little bit of a needs assessment. For you as participants, what are your pain points? What's on your mind? And what we heard from folks is, we're very worried about getting reimbursed for the services that we provide. Insurance reimbursement and comp competition from non-doctoral and other providers is a huge concern. And I'm just curious, how many of you get asked on a regular basis what you're doing about this? Raise your hand. OK, the, the lights are bright. I'm going to assume there were hand raises, all right? But I think that this is kind of when we look at ourselves and we look at what our needs are, that's a very um, high level thing that we think about and that's very salient. The Center for Workforce Studies in APA did a really interesting different kind of needs assessment. So they looked at all the online ads for psychologists, so specifically said psychologists in the ask, and they looked at the skill sets that were being requested. And take a minute and look at this because it's research, communication, management, and so on. You don't see direct service here so much. I see head nods, that makes me really happy. I was afraid there might be rotten fruit, I was ready to dodge, you know. But the bottom line is, the definition of who we are is changing. And there's really a disconnect, I don't know how that happened, there's really a disconnect in our focus on direct clinical service and getting paid for it, and the way the rest of the world is seeing us. So the rest of the world is seeing us as perhaps supervising that, or creating the systems, or evaluating the systems. Now, I want to be really clear. I'm not saying throw out the baby with the bathwater. We still have to fight for appropriate reimbursement for services. But I think we also have to expand the dialogue into being clear that we bring other things to the table. So as we look out in the room, I see this wonderful variety of ages of people. And so, you know, for folks in their late career, I think it's safe to say, particularly given that think this, this healthcare reform bus is moving kind of slow in some ways, that it's probably going to be okay for folks late in their career to continue to practice the way they practice. There may not be a huge need for change. For mid-career people, there's probably going to be a significant part of how they earn their living that is direct service, if that's what they want. But what I'm hearing from my peers, I like to pretend I'm mid-career, <laughs> is that this is, they're, they're having to be a little bit of a niche practice. They're having to find some need in the community that they and only they can meet. And they're having to diversify. Oftentimes, being in private practice alone is not enough. They might be working for someone. And coming from family medicine, I will tell you that physicians and other healthcare professionals are finding the same thing. There is a huge push right now for healthcare professionals to be working in interdisciplinary teams and to be working together, not siloed out in their individual private practices. So this isn't just happening to us, this is happening across the board. 
But I think as we look forward, we owe it to our early career folks and the folks in training now, which I'm thrilled to see we have graduate students here, to really try to help them think about what else might they do other than direct service, okay? Where are the diverse settings where our skill sets are going to be needed? And how do we make sure training and expectations are set such that people know how to do those different things? They're prepared for that different landscape. And again, that doesn't mean they're not gonna provide direct clinical service. It may just not be the core thing that they do all the time. No one knows for sure. And I'm aware of the whole sky is falling thing. Um, people have been hearing for a long time that things are changing. But I do think at the, that there's no harm in being prepared for things to be a little bit different. And actually, as far as I'm concerned, I think it's a really exciting time. So, you know, the old may you live in interesting times curse, I think we're living that in spades right now, right? But when you think about what do we as psychologists bring to the table, we know how to impact behavior. We know how to improve communication. We know how to help people with their relationships, okay? So if, if I, at first at one point I had a slide about all the problems of the world, climate change, and da da da, you know, all that's relevant to that too. But because I'm a health psychologist, I'm gonna focus in on these health-related things. So first of all, we know that health behavior and poor lifestyle choices are the key element in changing the health of our country. Because we don't take good care of our bodies and our environment is not set up to help us take good care of our bodies. And we as psychologists can help people, A, connect those dots, and B, work on changing those habits and help parents establish more healthy habits from very early on. One of the things that I'm incredibly excited about and just, just work with me here, because when I first say this, you're gonna think I'm nuts. But how many people here knew that the big retail pharmacies, Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, wherever you live, everybody has their own, how many of you knew that they are working very, very, very hard to become primary care providers? They are training their pharmacists to come out from behind the counter and talk to patients, to teach them health behaviors, to teach them how to take their medicines. They wanna change who they are in their role. Now obviously there's a lot of financial drive in that. But I think pharmacy could teach us in psychology some really interesting lessons. Because they've been pretty smart how they've gone about transitioning who they are in the healthcare field. It wasn't that long ago that they felt the same way we did that they were kind of knocking on the door. So if we want to figure out how to get to that table, and I think we're much more at that table now than we were not that long ago, we can look to what they've done. I also think that these companies would probably love to pick up what we're putting down because they want those, their professionals to know how to get people to be more successful because those patients will come back to that pharmacy and oh, by the way, while they're there, they're gonna pick up a lot of other stuff. Who here has not walked out of a CVS or a Walgreens like 10 bags when you went in for one thing? That's their ultimate goal, but at the end of the day, when I think about it, I think, you know, how cool is it how many people who have diabetes walk through a Walmart in a given day? How cool would it be if we as psychologists worked with that company and said, hey, we can help you not only help people be more successful in managing their health, by their medicines and so on, but let's talk about having in-store foot exams. Let's talk about how you set up a display to help somebody pick healthy foods. There's so much opportunity there, and that's but one of many, many different examples I could give. Another one, and this one's difficult, but we really have to look at how we handle end of life. It is not sustainable the way we're doing it right now. And if we look at why is it the way it is, a lot of times it has to do with relationships and families and grief. And again, we as psychologists have a skill set to bring to bear there to change the standard of care because people are oftentimes, unfortunately, huge amounts of money are being spent in those last few days really to no avail and in ways that ultimately make it harder for the families to move on and cope. So I see all kinds of opportunity. And like I said, I could talk about primary care all day long. And I think I'm aware there's probably some people in the room who are sick of hearing about primary care. Uh, maybe you're not seeing it happen in your state. I live in northern New Jersey. I call it the land, type, the land healthcare forgot um, because it, it's not happening so much in northern New Jersey. And I heard chuckles, maybe that was probably the New Jersey table. Um, it, it's really spotty across the country, but it's definitely burgeoning and growing, and again, a place for opportunity. So we have some answers that the rest of the world needs, but only if we're flexible about how, where, and with whom we provide those services. Everybody loves cats, right? I mean, you can never go wrong with a cat picture. Um, and we have to focus on who we serve outside, not what we need.
okay? And it's a both and. We've got to pay attention to getting reimbursed. But I think our strategy sometimes has been to just tell people how awesome we are. And I think our strategy needs to be that we get in there and we show people how awesome we are. So you guys as state leaders have a lot of opportunities over your next year or two, whatever your, your time is. And these are but a few ways that you can begin to change the dialogue. Because I think that part of the problem right now is, as a state leader, you're held accountable for this whole reimbursement thing. That's kind of what we end up focusing on. And we really need to start changing the dialogue and expanding it. Um, and again, tomorrow in, in the panel I'm on, I'll, I'll go a little deeper into these. So my overall, my takeaway, I taught sleep-deprived residents for a really long time. So I'm a big believer in like having one thing you hope people remember. The world needs psychology, but not just in 50-minute increments. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Good. I'm Arthur Evans. I'm the commissioner of the Philadelphia Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services. And um, it's a little bit about my, <laughs> I shouldn't be up there, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll tell you what that slide is about in a moment. Um, <laughs> I'm not a trend, <laughs> is that what I'm trying to say? Um, I forget, lost my track. <laughs> Um, uh, in my day job, what I do is I oversee the city's behavioral health department. And uh, it's a fairly large department. Uh, we are essentially the safety net for 1.5 million people in Philadelphia. Um, and we have uh, contractual relationships with uh, large hospital systems, over 200 providers, community mental health centers, children's providers, a whole range of, uh, of organizations. And um, one of the things that uh, I'm going to uh, disclose a little bit, one of the things you should know about me is I love being a psychologist. I love it. I was born to be a psychologist. And I know that. <clears throat> and every day I deal with really, really complicated problems. You work in an urban setting, in an urban setting, and you're the behavioral health commissioner, you get all kinds of very complicated problems that, that land on your desk. And one of the things that I've observed is that many of those problems are problems that psychologists are really well suited to solve. But my observation is this, that the people who have to solve those problems don't know that psychologists have the skills necessary to solve the problems. And psychologists don't often see the opportunities in those challenges that people are struggling with. And so what I want to talk about are challenges that we see in the healthcare arena that I think psychologists are really optimally, optimally uh, suited to solve. And in there, I see uh, many opportunities for our field. Uh, and so now is the time that you can look at the slide. <laughs> uh, and so I think that one of the things is if we're gonna really understand what those opportunities are, we have to understand what the trends are in the healthcare field, and we have to be able to distinguish between trends and fads. Um, and, and so what I wanna do is first start with talking about what the current paradigm is, uh, and then lead into how this paradigm is problematic and how healthcare is changing and, and where the opportunities are. So uh, this is uh, my view of the healthcare system in general, and behavioral health care in particular. People get sick, they go to treatment, we fix them, and they leave well. That's a basic paradigm of our health care system. Wouldn't you agree? You have to say yes or I don't have a presentation. <laughs> Folks, listen, I I'm Baptist, you have to talk back to me. If I, if I ask you a rhetorical question, I will let you know, otherwise, talk back. 
So this is the mental model for how we do our business. So the way we get health outcomes is people come to us as practitioners, we treat them, and they leave well, right? Thank you, thank you. All right, so it turns out, though, that there are a lot of challenges with this paradigm. I don't have time to go into all of them, but let me point out a few that are driving the changes that you're seeing in, in healthcare, particularly the triple A's. Well, one of the big problems with this paradigm is that many of the people that need our help never come across our doors. 90% of the people in your community who are addicted to whatever are never gonna come to a treatment program. And 40 to 50% of the people who have mental health diagnosis aren't gonna come to a treatment program. And so if we have this passive system that relies on people recognizing that they have a problem, knowing how to come to us, not having any stigma associated with going to, coming to us, we're gonna miss a lot of people. And it turns out that those people are often the drivers of healthcare costs in most healthcare systems. And we know it from studies, that if you treat those people who are untreated, who have behavioral health conditions, you can save a boatload of money. Okay, so that's the basic premise. And so let me point out one other um, challenge, that this model, this mental model of have to, having to have a diagnosis before we can intervene uh, presents for us. Um, if you look at the, the population, about 25% of the population has a mental health challenge, mental disorder. 75% uh, are folks who, at any given time, don't have a mental health challenge. And the way our healthcare system is set up, it's binary. Either you are well and you don't need any intervention or help, or you have a diagnosis. Now, all of us in this room know that that's not the case, They're, that people are really on a continuum, that there are some people who are at risk, uh, for, who could benefit from some kind of intervention. But our healthcare system doesn't allow us to do that because that's the, not the way we finance healthcare. And we certainly um, are not able to do a lot of health promotion kinds of activities and those kinds of things. And so the problem that the healthcare systems are, are facing is if we are going to change the incentives, move from a fee for service system to a system that incentivizes keeping people well. We have to move to a population health approach. Now, if you, if you look up po population health, you'll find, if you get 100 hits on Google, you'll find 100 different definitions. But generally, <clears throat> the idea is this, that if we're going to ever control the costs of health care, we're going to have to put health care systems at financial risk. And so rather than having systems set up on this idea that come to us when you're sick, we'll treat you and then discharge you. Healthcare systems are gonna be responsible for populations of people and the way they will be rewarded financially is by keeping that population as healthy as possible. Everybody with me so far? Yeah. Remember what I told you, thank you, thank you. It's a good audience. Um, so that's, the, that's the, the paradigm shift that's happening in healthcare. Now, I think that this presents us some tremendous opportunities as psychologists. Because once you go to a population health way of thinking about healthcare, as opposed to a black box healthcare, uh, black, black box approach, it opens up lots of opportunities, I believe, for what we do as psychologists and the skill sets that we have. So let me just run through very quickly some of the, the elements of a population health uh, approach and some of the things that are required if tomorrow I, was to, I were to say to you, you're now responsible for the population of Washington, D.C. as the commissioner of mental health, and your goal is to keep the population as healthy as possible. Think about that. What would you do? Would you set up the black box and say, okay, we're going to try to run everyone through treatment, or would you come up with other strategies? Okay, so that's the essence of of moving to a population health approach. So let me give you a few of the, the elements of a good population health approach, my view. Uh, you have to deal with social determinants. Only 10 to 20% of health outcomes are derived from our healthcare system. 80% coming from social determinants, things that are happening in people's 
uh, communities, lifestyle, those kinds of things. And so one of the first things that comes up for us is that we have to move out of that black box. We have to move away from just thinking about psychotherapy and medications to a whole range of ways of intervening in communities to promote health. We have to start thinking beyond the individual level. If the only people we work with are people in a one-on-one -on -one or maybe a family situation, one of the things that this requires is thinking about neighborhoods and communities and how do we intervene at that level. It also means moving further upstream. So rather than waiting for people to have a diagnosis and come to us, how do we do assertive outreach into communities? How do we reach people earlier? How do we do earlier intervention? It means that we're going to work with people who don't have a diagnosis. It means that we're going to work in non-traditional healthcare, non-traditional settings, not just integrated primary care settings, which I think is wonderful, and I'm glad that we're doing that, but we have to go into communities where people are, and we have to go to the, where people um, need our help the most, and often those are places that are uh, very non-traditional. Requires the development of new interventions and approaches, has to be data-driven, and the thing that I really like is that it puts the focus, I think there's an opportunity to put the focus on how do we help empower people to be, be, to be better stewards of their own health? How do we help empower? How do we do health activation? Everybody still with me? Okay, so I think that psychologists are really good at all of these things. We may not recognize it, we may not be doing it today, but these are the kinds of real world challenges that I face every day that I use the skills as a psychologist to deal with. So what I want to do is um, talk about and give you a few examples and help connect the dots between challenges of healthcare and what we can bring to the table. So I think a good population health approach uh, includes both a very effective treatment, but also community health strategies. And so I'm going to give you a few examples from uh, our work in uh, Philadelphia. So um, you may notice that um, treatment is not less important, in my view, in a population health. It becomes more important, and it becomes really important for it to be highly effective. Now, I think that psychologists can do a lot to help improve uh, treatment programs. So this is uh, language from our, uh, a recent RFP. So we required. Um, the program, a residential program, people who were responding to this RFP, to hire a psychologist. Uh, so here's a little um, uh, ad. This is why we need to be in policy, folks. So we can make those kinds of rules, right? So here's that's my plug for being in policy. So they have to hire a psychologist. And what you will notice from, in this language is this not only about uh, delivering psychological services, but it's also about things like um, facilitating the implementation of evidence-based practices, um, facilitating um, uh, program evaluation. Those are skills that if you've gone to the training that we've gone through, that you have as psychologists. And so what we're saying is, if we're going to have excellent treatment programs, you have to have this skill set embedded within those programs. And here are the kinds of things, the broad range of things that psychologists can do. Um, so one of the things that we've done in Philadelphia is to borrow very heavily from the public health world. And so one of the things that we do in, in public health is that we do screening. We screen for diabetes, we screen for cardiovascular disease, we screen for a lot of those things. We don't routinely do that in mental health. And so what we started doing a few years ago is um, uh, developing a screening strategy for behavioral health conditions. As I said, most of the people who need our help are not coming through our door, so how do we get to those individuals? So uh, this is our website. If you ever want to go to it, it's called healthymindsphilly.org. You will notice that it's nice and bright, and it doesn't look like a government uh, website. That is by design, because we wanted people to actually go there and use it. Um, and so uh, psychologists did the research to figure out what's the best screening tool for the population. Uh, we developed this website, uh, started with a few hundred people uh, going to the website. We've seen exponential growth, so we're now probably about 10,000 people a year. All of those, or most of those, are people who are not walking through our treatment doors. So we're, it's a way, a strategy for reaching that part of the population that needs us but may not be coming to us. It gives you um, options when you um, 
if you screen positively or even if you don't. And uh, we're moving to the point where we're going to be able to uh, give people the option for online psychotherapy if they um, screen positively with a coach. So we're trying to automate because we're reaching a whole population that we wouldn't ordinarily uh, reach. We also do these screenings in the community. So we go in the community, uh, we put up a big sign that says, how are you feeling today? Or get a checkup from the neck up. Uh, people are curious, they come over. People thought people in Philadelphia would never go and do a mental health screening in public. Well, we found just the opposite. We just had a screening um, a few weeks ago. We had over 100 people to, to take the screening uh, and hundreds more to get information. But it's sort of going into communities and um, uh, reaching people where they are. Um, we've also taken the idea, and you heard uh, Nancy talk about uh, retail health clinics. So most um, pharmacies now, you can go and you can take your blood pressure. We took the screening instrument put it into a kiosk, put it in a retail health clinic um, so that people could have access on their own walking into a, a health clinic. Uh, idea really caught on in Philadelphia. Now uh, Drexel University uh, does that. The, the screening company is called um, Screening for America, Screening for Mental Health. And um, we're taking that idea and embedding mental health screening tools uh, around uh, the, the city. The point is that uh, it's a way of reaching, if you, again, had pot responsibility for an entire population, how do you do that? How do you start to change the people's awareness around mental health issues? How do you start to identify people who might not otherwise be um, coming into our, our treatment programs? What I will tell you is that while these things look nice and easy, they are very complicated. How do you train people? What protocols do you set up? There are a whole set of things that I think psychologists are really well suited uh, to help. I'll just briefly mention this example. Um, uh, one of the things that happens in most communities is that uh, there are often uh, people are exposed to vicarious trauma or directly. Uh, typically what we've done in our system is to wait until people develop PTSD. We're now trying to be much more proactive and go into communities in the immediate aftermath, uh, educate people about what a normal trauma response is, what an abnormal response is, and how to get help. Really important if what we're trying to do is to intervene early. My last example is this. Um, I mentioned that um, stigma can be a huge problem in our, for, for our field. And, and, and often, well, if we develop the best treatment programs in the world, but people are embarrassed or afraid to come to us, not going to work. And so one of the things we've tried to do is to identify uh, ways of reducing community stigma. If you come to Philadelphia, this, the, that, you can see the rise there. That's actually a mural that's seven stories tall. This is from about a, a mile off. But if you come to Philadelphia, you'll see murals all over the, the city, which are really done by the community. The person who runs the program, a woman named Jane Golden, has created this wonderful process of engaging communities around topics. Communities come together, um, develop the ideas, develop the, the, um, the concept, and then they actually paint the murals on what's called parachute cloth that's adhered to the wall, then an artist comes by and finishes it off. So um, we started a few years ago using this process to engage communities about issues like um, suicide. So this is, this is a, uh, a wall that looks like, this was a, uh, um, a wall uh, prior to um, this mural being painted. Uh, a thousand people worked on this mural, and it, it was a psychologist who worked with community members doing workshops on suicide, suicide survivors, family members of people who had died by suicide. Uh, they came up with this concept out of that process and over time, uh, as I mentioned, we had about 1,000 people, including firefighters, and a lot of people who we would not have ordinarily uh, been able to engage. Or this one, uh, engaging men of color, because what we're trying to do is engage African-American, Latino, Asian men who are often not coming into treatment, went through a year-long process, workshops, those kinds of things, using that process to develop the, the um, concept that you see there. Uh, and this one, um, Another example of the uh, East Asian or the Asian community 
uh, which has identified gambling as a huge issue in Philadelphia, um, they developed this one. Uh, and the point is, these are communities that had we gone into those communities and said, hi, I'm the mental health commissioner, I'd like to talk to you about gambling addiction, we would have gotten 10 people. Uh, these uh, projects, we literally get hundreds of people to engage with us, with us. My point is this, that if we're talking about moving to population health, I think there are tremendous opportunities. I think it's gonna take a lot of innovation, and I think that that's where we as psychologists can shine. So I'll end by um, saying this. I think as long as, if we continue to view ourselves as primarily deliverers of psychological services, um, as opposed to mental health experts who can provide a whole range of, of services to community, including psychological services, but consultation, the ability to develop programs, I think we have a tremendous amount of opportunities that are there. And the key will be to, is this to show how doing these kinds of community interventions can help save healthcare costs. And I absolutely believe that. When we reach people who would never ordinarily not come into treatment, but we can get to them, get to them early, we know that that can save uh, healthcare dollars, increase, um, increase uh, health outcomes, and ultimately make systems better. So thank you. I hope I've uh, been able to stimulate your thinking a lot. And I love being a psychologist. Thank you. <laughs> Jeff Cantor, uh, Comprehensive Med Psych Systems, a uh, group based out of uh, Sarasota, Florida. Uh, I get a great chance to talk with you all today, and this is going to be a lot of fun. I actually get to show you pictures of my child, and, and as it grew through different developmental stages to adulthood. Uh, so this is going to be a lot of fun for me. Uh, I, really, I have actually very little to say today, other than talk a little bit about I have, actually only have four slides, which is unheard of. If anybody knows me, you know that for me to do a talk in 10 minutes would be about impossible. Uh, but I've got two slides on our group, and I've got two slides on my dream, my vision, what is the potential out there to help all psychologists in the country get on board with a business model that will help everybody uh, do, be able to access uh, different types of systems and processes that you just, as an individual or a small group, that people just don't have the capacity or the financial resources to be able to do. So first, let me talk a little bit about our group. Um, we started off in 1998 with four psychologists in a hospital, doing uh, in a, an acute care hospital. It, it went so well, the hospital liked us so much, we kept getting some more, you know, so many more referrals for inpatients on a cardiac open, uh, cardiac open heart surgery unit, on a rehab unit, all throughout the hospital, cancer unit, diabetes unit, et cetera, we just grew. Uh, and eventually, over time, we grew out of the hospital, moved across the street, uh, and basically, over time, got to the point where we had over 50 staff members, including psychiatrists, including psychologists, including social workers, uh, in, in, a variety of different, in a variety of different venues, mostly outpatient offices, also universities. We started a university counseling program where, where there was none. Uh, 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 public schools we've done projects in. We've done, we work in rehab hospitals, we work in, in, in the IMG Sports Academy, uh, if anybody knows that. Uh, we work in so many different venues. This, last year when I was here, I talked about vertical and horizontal integration, with a vertical integration being multidisciplinary, the horizontal integration being in multiple contexts and multiple venues. Uh, so basically at this time, actually at the end of 2015, we grew to the point of, uh, of uh, 107 multidisciplinary clinicians, all these different environments, uh, and uh, we actually doubled our business in the last year. We embarked in the last year on an acquisition phase in terms of buying different practices, uh, improving them, increasing them, adding different services to them, to the point that 
you know, we're adding in psycho, you know, we're adding in psychotherapy, neuropsychological evaluation, psychological testing, psychiatric uh, medication management, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which you'd all, you should all know about for treatment of depression, which I can talk about more later on, neurofeedback, biofeedback, et cetera. So the group has gotten very large, and in the process of getting large, it has opened up some areas of, of uh, access to us, working with, with uh, insurance companies, working with lots of other different players in the field that we would never have had with a small group or, or solo, uh, solo practice. And in the process of doing this, all of a sudden, at some point along the line, I realized this was, had become a major business. <laughs> and somewhere around the time of when we had about 10 psychologists or so, 10, 10 to 15 folks, and I started looking at this and I said, oh my God, I could probably make more money as an individual practitioner just doing my own private practice that I'm making out of this group. Where is this going? And I really realized that this has really become a business. I need to have a business model behind it. Um, I had, uh, luckily I had my father who is a you know, financial guru uh, give me some of the vision of how to create a business, how to interact with banks, how to deal with loans, how to deal with accounts receivable, how to deal with all the financial aspects that really go from a mom and pop uh, practice to a business of psychology. And I realized that this piece is missing for most folks. This is not what you get trained in in graduate school. This is missing. How do you do this? And how do you take it to the next level of 20 folks? How do you then hire in MDs into your practice? The concept of a psychologist having employing 20 some odd psychiatrists. I mean, what does this mean for the field of psychology to be able to say that? What does it mean to have a team of folks uh, that are practicing together as a group. Psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, how does that affect outcomes? How does it affect working with insurance companies? It became a very different business model, a very different clinical model than I had ever seen. And I think at this stage, we're uh, pretty unique. There's other folks that do have large groups that are doing some similar things. Dr. Vince Belvoir and I are actually gonna be talking some more about this tomorrow. Um, he's developed a huge group in Springfield, uh, in, uh, in Springfield Pennsylvania. So it's done, but it's pretty unique, and in the way that we're doing it, I think, uh, has opened up some doors and opened up some opportunities that has allowed us to continue to grow and develop some very innovative projects. Uh, all of this, as part of the business, requires a very sophisticated back office structure. We have to know about HIPAA. I have to have an EHR that works for over 100 clinicians. I have to have I have to be PQRS compliant. I have to have all kinds of different systems in place to make sure that this business moves forward. And it hasn't always been easy, and it has been painful at times, as the table from Indiana can attest to. Uh, so part of this has been a learning process for me as to how to build something that really hasn't existed before. And in the process of doing this, the cool thing about it is that it's allowed me to figure out Here's a, here's a solution, if I could offer this to other people, all around the country, what would it mean if everybody had access to the same types of infrastructure that we have that allowed us to become a successful business? So this is what I want to talk about for the next couple of minutes. This is a preview because it doesn't exist. <laughs> and you will notice there is some disturbing content in here. Uh, none of it's R-rated. I apologize for the R, that's the only one I could find on short notice. Um, but uh, it's, it's very exciting, and to me it's very thrilling uh, to be able to talk a little bit about this, because it came out of the development of our group, and one day, a year ago, actually at a think tank that uh, Shirley had put together, and Alan had put together, and, and Catherine sanctioned, we came up with an idea of, geez, how do we take everything that it's taken me to develop, and solutions to solve, problems to solve with solutions, how do I take that, and then open the door and the floodgates and allow it to, to get out there to everybody else to access without you having to be my employee. That was the critical piece because not everybody in this room wants to be my employee and I don't blame you. Um, but as years ago, I actually brought this up in the state of Florida. I created a, 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 a list, a communication listserv uh, to talk to people about how do we get people to coordinate to have better outcomes, to have better communication with psychologists. And we, I found that it was very, very difficult to come up with a structure that, uh, that would allow a, a business entity that would allow this to all happen. It really didn't go anywhere. I spent about two or $3,000 in legal costs, 
And basically they came back, the lawyers came back and said to me, well, <laughs> they need to be employees of your group, that'll solve your problem. And I said, most people don't want to be employees of my group, so how do we do this? So fast forward now 10 years later to a think tank when we come up with the idea that, hey, if I can figure out a structure to take what I've learned, to take what we've put together and offer it to everybody out there, what would this mean? How would we do this? What's the process? So that's what the preview is, it doesn't exist. This is not long-term future. This is hopefully in the next 12 months, maybe even eight months, that this thing should be up and running. And this is called a management services organization. It's not my group, it's a separate entity. It's a separate business structure that takes all the pieces of what I've done, puts it into a menu format, and allows everybody here, every practicing clinician, everybody who's in a fee-for-service model, every individual, small group, et cetera, to access the pieces that they want to create for themselves a successful business model that will underlie their successful clinical service provision model. So what if, I mean, you guys all know, I mean, if you're on the, the, your state listservs, you know, how, how many questions a day do you see? What's the best EHR? You know, how do I get a good billing system? Uh, does anybody know somebody that, that does this kind of billing and my collections aren't very good? And is Skype HIPAA compliant? And how do I do telehealth? Is that, a, is that available now? So I see that on our state listserv every day. I just kind of chalk it up as another question, as another question, as another question. Most of those questions we've solved for ourselves. It's just that they haven't been available as an entity to everybody out there. So what if you were a member of a group which offered a sophisticated EHR, something much more sophisticated than Office Ally, something that would give you a graphical format of how your patients are making progress, something that would do a comparison against other normative groups of other psychologists in other parts of the country in terms of your utilization, how many times you saw patients, the frequency that you saw patients, by diagnosis, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a HIPAA compliance plan. Everybody knows about HIPAA. What you don't know about HIPAA will, could crush you. Uh, what if you had somebody that has already been through and has developed a very sophisticated HIPAA compliance plan that you could tap onto that? What if PQRS was part of the, part of the system uh, in, in conjunction with the APAPO uh, PQRS Pro system? Uh, credit card systems, everybody takes credit cards, people don't take credit cards. If you actually look at your credit cards and you take the amount that you pay in fees relative to the amount that you bill, invariably, it will be over 3%, probably 3.5%. They will tell you they have a 2.5% plan for you. Have you ever looked at that credit card bill? It's got platinum this, this, that, this, that. They charge you, and you have no idea how they charge you, and it'll, it'll be different every month. What if you had a system in place that you could access a volume-based discount credit card plan that got you 2% and saved you 40% of your fees and credit cards? What if you had an encrypted email system that you could go to? What if you had clinical outcome measurements? Uh, Part of this is what's called a group purchasing organization. Because of volume, what if you could get a discount on your testing supplies through PAR, who's already on board with this and has offered a 10% discount? What if you could get discount office supplies when you move to a new office and you need computers, you need monitors, you need furniture, you need chairs? What if you could get that as part of this group? Uh, the idea is that the volume of different, uh, the volume of different, in the infrastructure, the EHR, the VIP phone system, the volume of that going through this drives discounts to everybody and allows you to have access to pieces that you would never otherwise have access to. The bottom line here, <clears throat> I don't know exactly how to say this, uh, <clears throat> more effective participation in innovative payer relationships. What if you're part of a, a member, not an employee, what if you're a member of a group that has access to influence and be part of insurance processes and systems, et cetera. It's a new dance. It's no longer a war dance, but it becomes a tango with you and the insurance industry because they want the size and scope. They come to me saying, we want to do innovative programs with you, value-based contracting, uh, perform, pay for performance deals that we haven't done anymore. They want to do pilot projects. Because the insurance companies, they want more efficiencies. They want you to get patients better faster. They want you to have your patients have less, spend less money on medications. We can do that. We can show we have data-driven plans. If you can tap into that and I can say, oh, geez, the, our entity has five psychologists in Nebraska, has 15 psychologists in Colorado, has 75 psychologists in California. We can 
take all that data, put it together, then all of a sudden we're talking about a national stage dealing with these uh, payer insurance relationships. Changes everything, it's a new dance. The concept is, in three boxes or less, is what if there was an entity out there that everybody could tap into, a menu of services of 25 or 30 different types of discounts, uh, uh, EHR systems, VIP phone systems, credit card systems, what if there's 25 or 30 of those? And you could say, hey, in my practice I do this pretty well, I need number two, five, and seven. I want number three, four, two, seven, nine, and ten. And, for, and become a member of a group. Not exactly a Sam's Club, but the concept is a menu-driven item list that you can pick what you want to make your practice better, more efficient, take care of the infrastructure, take care of the back office stuff so that you could run your business, you could run your clinical psychology practice much more efficiently, better, and have it be much more lucrative. Uh, what if we had that entity? What if you belonged to, or, or were part of a group whose sole purpose was to assist you with non-clinical business functions so that you could concentrate on the clinical aspects of your practice and so increase the efficiency, value, and profitability of your business? What if I took what we've learned through the growth of our group and handed it off to you and say, take my knowledge, take what we've done, and use that, take that piece. You don't have to recreate it. You don't have to go on a list and say, what's the best EHR system? Hey, this group over here, we have an EHR that's been def def uh, refined, developed for psychologists that works, that you can take even pieces of that that you want. Don't pay for this piece over here. And it's no longer asking a question as to where is it. It's you get the advice, you get the knowledge, and you get the actual product uh, at, with discounted rates, with better relationships with the insurance companies that helps improve your practice, better outcomes at lower cost and more money. I mean, who would not do that? That's the concept. And this is coming. <laughs> it's coming soon. This is not 10 years in the future. This is in the process of being developed with the assistance of APAPO, uh, as with resources from APAPO, because this is a way to take all the individual practitioners and, in effect, create a mega group, but maintain your independence and autonomy. Make sense? That's it. Please welcome to the stage Shirley Ann Higuchi, Associate Executive Director for Legal and Regulatory Affairs. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. I hope my mic is working. I went to the bathroom, and then everything fell down, and I had to get replugged up. So if you can't hear me, let me know. Uh, well, I, I really like what uh, Dr. Kander had just mentioned, and I want to put a plug in for our Monday plenary working with insurers. We're really lucky uh, this, this weekend that we have representatives from Aetna uh, Behavioral as well as Optum and Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield that will talk to us about what they're looking for from psychologists and what they're looking for uh, from our leadership here today. So as many of you know, the APAPO practice organization had a very successful multi-state summit in New York, as Catherine mentioned earlier. And that was in New York last May. It was a real challenge because with our restricted resources, we had to really rely on our partnership with the states to pull together, to charge registration, to market the program. And you know what? We were completely sold out. And for that, I have to thank the New York State Psych Association and the New York State Neuropsychological Association for partnering with the practice organization, the Pennsylvania, Kinetic, New Jersey Psychological Association. So I want all of you to stand today and be recognized because without you guys, we wouldn't have been able to put on that summit. So let's give them a big hand. And, and this was completely on a shoestring budget. And what was great about this is we put a little money back into the State Psych Association and used it as development to try to plan ahead for the future. But I got to tell you, it's not easy. We're hosting our next summit in Washington, DC. And it's going to be a tough one, because the, the, the jurisdiction of the District of Columbia and what goes on in Maryland and Virginia is very different than what goes on in other states, as, as well in the Midwest. 
But on May 20th, I invite all of you, if you're able to come down to the APA headquarters to join us for another summit where I'll get local payers to come to that summit that are active both in Maryland, Virginia, and DC, and hopefully Pennsylvania, who actually just recently joined in to be a partner, to come over to the APA headquarters and participate in this great summit. So can I get those state psych associations to stand? Because I'm not going to be able to do it without you. Come on, guys. Pennsylvania, DC, Maryland, Virginia. And I really need you guys to step up the plate and market this program so we can bring in money to the states as well as to support the practice organization. The big kahuna one that's coming down the path is Chicago, June 24th. I got to really thank the Illinois Psych Association for being the sponsor of this one. And we were able to garner the Michigan Psych Association, Ohio, Minnesota, Missouri, Indiana, and Alan Nesman and Connie just told me that Kentucky and another state signed up. Wisconsin, we got that last minute. So I have to ask all you guys to stand up too because I really got to rely on you to pull that one off. <laughs> Again, this is, this is without a budget. So that means we got to get registrations up and guess what? We are going to raffle two tickets to the summit of your choice. If you look behind your badge, apparently there's a ticket that you can place out by the um, uh, charging hub where the phone place is. There's a Capitol building model, you just stick your card in there. And you could either choose an online version uh, to come in or you could actually come in town and actually participate in either DC and, uh, and or uh, Chicago, your choice. And the drawing will take place on Monday evening, right before the state leadership banquet. So the multi-state team, and, and I am wearing my button here, even though I don't know if I, I was supposed to, but if you see Alan, Connie, or Javier wearing the button, please approach them if you would like us to come to your state and partner with your other state associations to put something on in your jurisdictions, or if you have questions or you're interested in participating in any way, maybe you have a special expertise, please feel free to talk to any of us. But these, these summits and state leadership this weekend will give you a sampling of what to expect in these multi-state summits in various jurisdictions. And if you're interested in purchasing um, the New York pilot, the New York State Psych Association, I know Tom Cote, you're here someplace, just wave them down because we actually recorded it and we've been able to develop an educational module for that. So tomorrow morning and the rest of the weekend, what are you going to experience? You're going to experience a drilling down of this opening session that you just heard today. A drilling down of the big models that Jeffrey talked about and also the drilling down of the independent practice models that Dr. Ruddy spoke about. Also on Monday, we have a legal and risk management issues where we partnered with the trust to develop cutting edge risk management issues in these types of models, as well as bringing in a lawyer that can help talk to you about what you need to prepare for in the event that you want to pursue any of these models. So thank you so much for coming. And I will be calling Drs. Ruddy, Evans, and Cantor back to the stage for a Q&A. Alan, Connie, and Javier will be manning the mics. But please feel free to ask any question you desire. I think we have about a half hour left for the program. Thank you. So I know there are a couple of mics out there, but I'm going to open it up with one question. So what are the areas of growth and change within the profession that you see as most hopeful for our profession? And I'll open it up with Nancy. Um, I think the fact that this is where we're focused for our state leadership conference, the fact that we have these summits going on, really shows the openness that I think has happened in the last number of years, where people are starting to think bigger than previously. And I think, the, I hope the next layer on is going to be to see summits that are not only across states, but also across professional organizations. So I know Susan's doing a wonderful uh, 
summit on integrated primary care, and we're gonna be inviting people from all different disciplines. And I think that's a model for where we need to head, because otherwise it looks like we're just out for ourselves, and I'd like to see us be part of that healthcare dialogue in a broader way. Okay, great. I, I think um, the, from my experience, the growth of a group, the growth of uh, people getting together, whether it's under one roof as an employee-based model or if it's a group of independent practitioners getting together with multiple services, multiple areas of expertise, multidisciplinary, as I mentioned, it opens a door to growth, to go into to hospitals, to go into primary care, to go into, actually, we, on Friday, we just signed a deal to provide services for, for the St. John's County in, um, in St. Augustine in Florida to provide consultation services for the 911 operators. This is not something that I had ever envisioned we would ever do. These 911 operators are traumatized every day with every single phone call. So to have, have a group, have enough people with different areas of expertise that we, you can expand and branch out into other areas that you never would have thought about, to me that's a growth area that you know, I, I never would have envisioned. Well, I, I think that um, this, this idea of population health um, is really important. I think it's gonna take off uh, and the reason I talk about it in terms of trends versus fads is because you can look at ACOs and whatever the newest, model are, new, newest models that are out there are, but the trend that's underneath all of those is this notion that payers like myself are going to increasingly put provider systems at financial risk, give people responsibilities for taking ownership, so to speak, over the health care of individuals, that's a trend that we're going to see continue. And I think it's uh, ripe for psychologists. I think that uh, it's uncharted territory. It's a frontier. I think it's going to take a lot of innovation and creativity. And I think that the skill set that psychologists bring, they're really optimized. I think we are optimized to work in that kind of complicated environment. Thank you. I see a question right out here. It's on. Hi, my name is Steve Bloomfield. I'm from Florida. I'm a former president of the Florida uh, Psychological Association. I'm a federal advocacy coordinator. And I'm a, a late career psychologist who has a private forensic practice. I accept that we're moving in a different direction and away from small independent practices. As a leader, as a state leader, however, I know we're going to talk about membership issues on Monday, but as a state leader, we see our state association membership falling. The practice association membership has fallen by something like 40% over the last year or two years. I'm curious from the people who are developing these larger systems what the role of a state association or a practice association has if I'm affiliated or become affiliated or employed in a larger institution. And that not only includes the institutions and entities you were talking about, but hospitals, VAs, universities. My practice needs and advocacy are going to be fulfilled by those institutions and entities and diminish the need, I think, for state associations and the practice associations. So I'm interested to hear your perspectives on that. Okay, Arthur? Sure. Uh, I think it's a great question. I, I actually don't think that um, the kinds of changes, certainly the changes that I'm talking about are going to diminish the role of state psychological associations. I've been in government and policy positions the last 20 years. You know, I was in Connecticut. I was a member of CPA. When I, in um, Pennsylvania, I'm a member of, of PPA. Because I think that those organizations make our, our field um, stronger. And I think that, um, you know, certainly what I've tried to do in, in, in my career is, even though I work primarily in policy, in the policy realm, is to um, use what I know as psychologists, use what I know that psychologists can bring uh, to help enhance the, the field. And so I, I think that, if anything, it's going to make uh, what state psychological associations do um, even more important uh, in, in terms of helping people to see some of these trends. Thank you. I see a question right here. Right you. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, good afternoon. Jorge Wong, uh, president of the California Psych Association. Uh, I'm really interested in hearing more about how you were able to um, work on the population health part to increase psychologists as a requirement of the RFP in working in the uh, Philadelphia program. I work in an FQHC in California and also really big into public uh, behavioral health. 
And due to cost, oftentimes California's 58 counties, uh, which actually hires a lot of uh, mid-level folks, like a lot of master clinicians, rarely include psychologists in their um, array of uh, mental health providers. And I'm wondering how you are able to put that onto an RFP, because I'm really curious as to how to actually put it onto a state mandate to hire more psychologists in the public health sector. Sure. Um, I could do it because I'm the commissioner, <laughs> but the bottom line. <laughs> and they do what I tell them. <laughs> <That's> my man. <laughs> so um, that's, I am serious, but seriously, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that that's why I think it's so important for um, us to be in policy positions. Because I sit in so many rooms where people don't understand who we are, what we do, uh, they make bad decisions as it relates, and you've heard some of them already. Uh, uh, you heard Catherine and what Shirley was talking about. Um, so I think it's really important for us to be in those policy positions so that we can, by fiat, say, this is the way it will be. You have to have, if you're gonna have this kind of program, you know, if you have to have psychiatrists, if you have to have nurses, you have to have psychologists, and here are the reasons why. So um, to, to, just to give that context. Um, so I don't know if I answered all of your question, but. That's Thank you. We got Connie over here with a question. Uh, hello, my name is Travis Lochran. I am a graduate student at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and the Regional as Advocacy Coordinator uh, for the Southwest Region as part of the APAGS ACT team. And uh, I have a question. Uh, I mean, I think it's really exciting talking about expanding the practice spectrum, but from a graduate student perspective, where most uh, training models are still kind of the traditional um, current practi practi uh, practice spectrum, what recommendations do you have for graduate students to um, prepare themselves for this expansion or also uh, recommendations for programs themselves to adapt to the new, uh, new models? Get an Nancy, MD, get well, I was gonna have Nancy respond and Jeff, you want to do follow up. So um, I think that there is an evolution occurring in training right now. Um, Commission on Accreditation did look at this very issue and we talked about the importance of um, creating room you know, right now, I think that the programs are so locked in to what they have to, to train on, it's challenging to create space for alternate models. Um, but there's places to do it. I mean, in the practicums that either are developed or that students can help develop, um, where you go on internship, what kind of postdocs you do, as well as just the mentorship that you seek. So um, one of the things that um, I want everyone to know, actually, Barbara Ward Zimmerman is sitting right there, and I want to give her enormous credit for being part of a committee that we have putting together a course on integrated primary care that will be a plug and play, because part of the problem we have is that very few um, graduate programs have anybody on their faculty who's ever worked in primary care. So how do you teach it? So we created this course that's just like plug and play. Like, it doesn't matter if you've never done it. We'll support you, we'll tell you what you need to know, and you can at least do some foundational and then even subject matter modules. So that's gonna be released very soon. And that was one of the main kind of needs we saw. In addition to that, um, on the Education Directorate website, there is a list of places that offer training, particularly in primary care. But I think as a student and it's APEX, I really encourage you guys to go talk to your faculty and say, look, we want to make sure that our training experiences are preparing us for the kind of jobs that are gonna be out there eventually. And so, yeah, it's great to be in a counseling center, or it's great to be here, but how do we get out? So for example, in a college counseling center, guess what? They're usually right next door to the health center. Okay. So, enough Thank said. you. Jeffrey, quick follow-up. Uh, specialize, coordinate, integrate, gets, uh, get an MBA. That would be helpful. Or MPH. Uh, or MPH, that would be fine. But that's the, I mean, that's the future. I mean, that's what you gotta do. And uh, it, it takes, if you're able to do that, and you're able to grow something, and then it goes back to what Arthur was saying about putting psychologists in policy positions is beyond that even, it's putting position, psychologists in positions of influence. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield asked me to be on their advisory board for the state of Florida. I'm advising them on ADHD testing, that kind of stuff, what's gonna happen, what happens if they do this, how are psychologists gonna respond? Okay, um, I, got, I got a question right here, Alan. Hi there, uh, Terry Strong from Oregon. I just want to let everyone know, 18 months ago, I launched an integrative care private practice in Eugene, Oregon, and we're still in business, and we're growing exponentially. And so for the gentleman who just spoke, we have postdocs as part of our program, and we're going to try to get a pre-doctoral internship going. But my question, my reason for coming up was for Dr. Cantor. In our state, there's a large uh, movement toward independent practice associations. And I was wondering how your <coughs> model of the management 
uh, services organization is similar or different to the IPA model? It's complicated. <laughs> Uh, ind an independent practice organization is different than a managed service organization, but it has some similarities. Um, Jeffrey, I can take that if maybe, you Maybe, I was going to say maybe yeah, well, Alan. let Alan take yeah. this one. <laughs> I think that may be better. Terry's standing, right, Terry's standing right next to me. So the, the, the MSO, as uh, Kevin Ryan will say on, on Monday, is it's sort of a IPA on steroids. Okay. Or as I like to say, it's a promiscuous IPA. An IPA is really designed <laughs> It's really designed to <laughs> primarily serve one payer. Uh, MSO was designed to market more broadly. And the other difference, which you'll see in, in Dr. Cantor's model, is it isn't just creating a network. It's providing a lot of management services. So those are two of the basic differences. But we t we'll be talking about those more tomorrow morning at 11. Come by tomorrow. Javier, you have somebody over there? Yeah, yeah hi. It's Tom Swales from the Ohio Psychological Association. Uh, Jeff and everyone, how can the state psychological associations facilitate the creation of MSOs, facilitate the growth, incubation, what role will we play in making that happen? Uh, it's a good question, and actually I don't know if Vince is out there, but Vince has been very involved with the Pennsylvania Psychological Association, which is, I think, uh, he's gonna talk about tomorrow as well. Um, but the support of the state organizations, I think, is really important. Uh, and making sure they get the word out, making sure that they help uh, they help get the information out about what the MSO is, I think is really important. What's critical here is to understand that the, the, your state organizations, APAPO, APO cannot do this. You can't go to APA and say, where's my EHR? You can't go to APA and say, can you create this for me? I'm paying my dues, where is it? So I need the support to be able to do this. It's not an easy thing to develop, and it requires people's understanding um, of, of the information that's going out there. So I, I don't know, communication is important. I, you know, we're just starting off on this, so I... And, and I would, I, I would <clears throat> suggest that you try to corral Alan or myself after this so we can right. talk more about it, but I, I wanted to move to the question that Alan has right. now. Hi, this is Brian Stagner. I'm Director of Professional Affairs in Texas. Um, I'm interested just in hearing a little more information about how either in the integrate, integration with medical practices or in the community psychology kinds of outreach things you're doing, we all can see there's some distal um, uh, outcomes. The population health is gonna get better. And all of the individual things you talked about seem like good ideas, but what, what data will you have to sort of justify or to decide this intervention really is paying off in those distal outcomes? For example, what outcomes, what would you look at to decide doing those murals was really worth doing in terms of population health or doing um, some of these other things that you guys talked about? Just how, how are you going to document and justify your budget in a way? Sure. Uh, that's a great question. So being a psychologist, of, of course, we evaluated the mural work. Um, actually, Jack Teeves at Yale um, evaluated the, the mural project, and we found um, uh, effects and a couple of different levels. At the individual level, we found some effects in terms of people perceiving their communities to be, um, uh, I'm sorry, this is at the community level, people who had not even participated in those projects feeling that their communities were safer because of the change in the environment. And if we think about the whole idea of social determinants, one of the things we know is that how people's community context looks has a direct bearing on their health outcomes. So that gives us some glimmer of hope that we can do these kinds of community level interventions and have an impact even on people who didn't participate in the mural process itself. We also found individual level effects in terms of, of people's um, self-advocacy around uh, their health uh, status. So um, you know, these things I think can have those impacts. And, and again, I think this is why it's important to have people who can help figure this stuff out, try things, evaluate them, and decide whether or not uh, we should continue them. One other thing that I'll say, you know, I talked about the Engaging Men of Color um, initiative where we're looking at African American, Latino, and Asian men uh, because we don't, we're not getting the kind of access uh, for some of those groups. Uh, one of the things we look at um, routinely is penetration rates, and so we're constantly looking at uh, the proportion of the population that's accessing services. So that would be the kind of thing that we would look at uh, to see whether or not we should continue these kinds of um, strategies. Javier, you have a question over there? 
Yes, Barry Katz, president of the New Jersey Psychological Association. Uh, we're having a difficult time with our early career psychologists, especially in New Jersey, we have permit holders who have great restrictions upon how they can practice, how many hours, and intensive levels of supervision are required. However, they're competing against social workers, licensed professional counselors, and other professions that don't have such restrictions. So we find in many of these settings that the administrations will hire these other professions because they don't want to have to pay for supervision and time and the paperwork required that we put upon our early career psychologists in regulatory as well as statutory means. You know, I think it comes down to legislative ad advocacy. Um, I think that each state, and this is why this particular conference is so exciting to me, because each of you has your battles to fight. And I live in Mountain Lakes, New Jersey, so I feel your pain. New Jersey is a very difficult practice environment for psychologists right now. And I think the State Association has done a lot of wonderful things. Our focus, personal opinion, is that we really, again, have to get off the reimbursement and on these bigger policy issues and being recognized for what we bring to the table. Um, until quite recently, there was actually a law in the books in New Jersey that you could not provide me medical services and mental health services through the same door, okay? So um, I also think that there's great opportunity in our state. So the Mental Health Association, there are some other advocacy groups that really wanna partner with us. And I think that, that as in all states, um, and I, I really think one of the themes of our, our, our talk today is numbers. Like, there is power in numbers, whether it's a service management organization or public health or primary care and doing things differently. We've got to partner with other people who share our same agenda of trying to help our states, our populations be more psychologically healthy. Um, and I think those laws in New Jersey are not helping. And we, we, have, a, we have many crises in New York, or excuse me, New Jersey, particularly with opioid addiction. And so I think there's a lot of places we can partner with those other organizations and try to improve, let all boats rise. But thank you. God bless you. <laughs> Power to you, dude. Hi. Oh, okay. Um, here. Okay. Hi, Lainey Ducharme. I'm uh, uh, probably one of your senior psychologists that's been in private practice for 30 years. And I guess one of the questions I have is, I think a lot of people are not business, don't, aren't trained to be business owners. And I also think a lot of people don't want to run a business of 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 psychologists. I'm very active in 42, and I guess um, having come from 30 years ago, a behavioral medicine business, because I'm a nurse also, so I'm trained in behavioral medicine, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on people in independent practice who are pretty successfully working almost like partners without walls, with clinical practices around, with pediatricians, with obstetricians, with various people, and being able to encourage some of our young people to not necessarily, if we looked at that model of the senior student, you know, senior psychologists can still do private practice. As we move downwards, we can't. But just what are your thoughts and how can we encourage young people? Because I do think there are gonna be, there are gonna still be a member, a percentage of the population that would like that private practice model. So I'm wondering your thoughts on all of that. I mean, what I would say is mentorship. I mean, I, I think that our, our Sorry, early mentorship. mentorship, our early career people are looking for mentorship. They're looking for ways to be successful. And you mentioned something really important, which is that those partnerships in the community become referral sources. But as a private practitioner, make yourself useful to your community. Do a needs assessment. Figure out what isn't there now and fill that need and you'll be successful. Because I agree with you. Actually, we were laughing before because I said to him, I said, you are so entrepreneurial. I would never, ever, ever have the guts to do what you did. And I don't think I'm alone. I think a lot of us just are not like built that way. So I think it's important that we recognize there's gonna be a whole continuum of ways to be a psychologist going forward. Private practice isn't not going to be part of it, but it may look a little different than it does now, or it may be part of someone's work life, not their entire work life. The MSO model that I'm talking about is built specifically for folks um, that are in independent practice, that don't have to leave independent practice, that have good successful practices, but are worried about what they don't know. What you're gonna find out in my talk tomorrow, how I got started on this in terms of the, some of the growth stuff that I got involved with was, and how I started a group with Vince and a few other folks is because I got scared to death what I didn't know. And the more I knew, then the more I became afraid of what I didn't know. So I needed to find that stuff out. So the folks that are in private practice, I mean, if you're in a FIFA service, if you're in a self-pay model, all the power to you, that's fine. You don't really need to know that much. You don't have to worry about Medicare, PQRS, whatever. But if you take insurance, 
You're worried about rates, you're worried about HIPAA, you're worried about even faxes, even faxes now that used to be uh, not part of HIPAA. If you're faxing electronically, guess what? You're now part of HIPAA. There's issues that you gotta deal with there. So even if you're an independent private practice, late stage, late career person who's pretty successful as it is, it's worth looking into the, the components of and find, you know, components of what the MSO offers and then figuring out, oh, I'm already doing this fine, I don't need that. Oh, but this, what's this over here? Tell me a little bit about that. You know, and then saying, I, I'd like to access that piece of the, of the pie because I didn't even know it was a problem for me. So I, I think it's built for that. Okay, is there a question right here down the center, Alan? Yes. Oh, yeah. oh no. Okay, over here? Yes. <laughs> You, th you thought you could quiet me by taking the microphone away from me up, <laughs> up there, huh? Listen, you know, 30 years ago when I started what I think was an innovative practice at the time, there, with some other colleagues doing similar kinds of practices, there was some pushback from sort of more established psychologists in the state. They saw the entrepreneurial kinds of approaches that myself and some others in the state were taking and were a little intimidated by it concern, what it meant for the practice. Over time, what we were doing became the mainstream. And I think we have to assume that what Jeffrey is doing and what Arthur and, and, Nancy. and Nancy are talking about are going to be the mainstream in the next decade or so. This is what, where psychologists are going to be getting the training. And it is unfortunate. We do have some issues in our field with making sure that our training gets aligned with the realities of practice. That's true in any discipline, the, the, the disconnect between training models and, and practice. We can make that more reciprocal, I think, and there are lots of things that we can work on to do that. But getting back to what the SPTAs can do, because most of the people here are representative leaders of SPTA, so that's what I really wanted to talk about. I think you can be welcoming to people like Arthur and Nancy and Jeff, to your conventions, to your conferences. You can participate in the summits that Shirley talked about. Oh, yeah. There are lots of opportunities to put on programming and to the extent possible, maybe engage in some of the more innovative educators in your state who might be willing to participate and talk about what they're trying to do at the training level to connect up with some of the more innovative kinds of things going on in the practice world. Um, I think forming committees in your association. Uh, one of the, you know, when I got involved in this whole thing, at the time, I was encouraged by the person who then was heading up what was called uh, the HMO committee in our state to create what we called the Insurance and Managed Care Committee. At the time, people bristled at the idea, a managed care committee? You know, it was our effort to address the problems that were occurring by man from managed care. You have to innovate and evolve your SPTA to address the current realities, and the current realities are the things, amongst others, that Nancy and Arthur and Jeff talked about here today. So I really want to say the SPTAs can be the laboratory for lots of great ideas. And I finally want to finish today by just expressing a tremendous amount of gratitude to Shirley and Nancy and Arthur and Jeff and, and obviously to Catherine. I just think we had a phenomenal lineup of speakers today. I am goosebumps today with what I heard and the way this went. And I just really want to thank all of you. Thank you, Dan. Um, I really appreciate the comments that Dan made about the, the role that state psych associations, and I didn't mean to sort of cut that conversation short earlier, but the whole point of the summits is to engage the states, have the states partake and participate in our success along with the practice organization and uh, our staff. So I, I hope that all of you will talk to us about the summits. I have one last question for each of the speakers. And it really has to do with, if you could give us one advice for these state leaders to take home today, what would that advice be? And I'd like to start with Nancy. I always get to go first. I don't know what that means. Um, so I think that the one thing that I would love to see everyone do is get outside our boxes and really ask yourself, why am I doing this this way? Because often we do things a certain way because we've just always done it that way. And to do that with every decision you make. Question, ask, and get people involved who are not part of your group. One of the challenges that we face in, in um, any professional organization is everyone's so busy. 
There's always a core group of people who give up their time and give service back to their organization. And I've been part of those groups, and I, I've met some of my favorite people in the world doing that work. But I will also say sometimes you get into groupthink, and you get into a, well, we know what's going on, and those people out there that aren't engaged don't. This also has to do with membership, which is if people are not coming to you in droves, then there's something you're not giving people that makes them not feel that you're relevant to them. And that idea of a needs assessment, that idea of what can my state association do that's going to make people knock our doors down because we're giving them something they need, I think that's the keys to the kingdom. But it's much easier said than done, and I realize that. And all of you deserve enormous credit for the amount of time and energy you put into our field. I, I can't thank you enough. Jeffrey and then Arthur. Uh, I don't know if it's advice. I just give the message back that things are very good in the psychology world. Things are not horrible. Things are growing. Things are getting reimbursed better. Uh, there is more influence with insurance companies. For, in, my, in my world, uh, and, I, and it's expanding, uh, things are only going to get better. And I don't, I don't, you know, there's no need for whining, complaining, moaning, groaning. I mean, you hear it all the time. It's not necessary. There's lots of things and positive and innovative practices to get involved with for people. Uh, it's, it's good out there. I mean, this is your, these are your APA PO dollars at work bringing you the good news that things are good out there. You know, if you, if you look for it, if you sit at home in your, in your office and you just look at your Aetna insurance bills and that's all you do all day, you're going to whine and moan and groan and complain. If you get involved in integrated care, if you get involved with the police, if you get involved with whatever areas that nobody else has thought of, it's great. And people are willing to pay for it. People want your expertise. They're willing to pay to sh if you can show them your outcomes and why what you're doing is helpful. It's good out there. Uh, Thank you. So Arthur. Good. So they, they stole my thunder, the, the two of them. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I started by saying I, I love being a psychologist. I, I think our profession, I think our profession is one of the most undervalued in, in our society. I, I see so many, probably not trained as, in experimental as well as community and, and clinical. I use all of that every day when I, when I do my work. And I see so many challenges. I, I, I agree. I think there's so many issues out there. And I don't think it takes a lot of effort to uh, reach out to schools or to police or to child welfare systems or to whomever. I think there are a lot of things that we can do. I think there are a tremendous amount of opportunities. And, and I think you know, the challenge for us is going to be how do we convert those into you know, opportunities that help us financially. But in terms of the opportunities being there and the need being there, I think it, it is there. And I think if we can reach out uh, as a profession uh, to these various systems, I think there are lots of opportunities. So I, 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 what I would say is lean into the current healthcare environment. I, I, don't, I think that there are a lot of opportunities there. And one other thing, uh, for you graduate students, remember what you're doing in statistics, OK? I just want to tell you that. Uh, we need people who understand data in our field. Well, I want to write grants. Oh, and how to write grants. How to write grants. Yeah, thank you. Well, I thank everyone for coming. Thanks to our online registration folks that dialed in. Um, and thank you to our speakers. I'd love to give them a big round of applause. And we look forward to seeing you at the other workshops. We have a terrific lineup. Read your program. It's excellent. Thank you.